Let us worship God. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olive shall fail, and the field shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Let's stand. <laughs> Good and gracious God and Heavenly Father, we, we praise you for your goodnesses to us. We thank you that because of, of your salvation, our lives have a, a meaning and an ultimate hope. We have a, a purpose and a context in which to, to think and act. We pray that you'd make us more aware of who we are because of what you have done for us. We pray that this would cause us to be joyful and to be secure in uh, our calling to and what we should be doing and how we should be living our lives. We pray that you'd give us an understanding of the world around us in terms of uh, what we understand about right and wrong and, and the struggle that we have in a sinful world. Help us not to be distracted by the evil of the world. We pray most of all that you'd help us not to be overcome by it. Keep us from sin and anything that would keep us from fellowship with you and, and serving your kingdom. We acknowledge that we often do fail you in word and thought and deed. We, we acknowledge that, that we often um, let the cares of this life be our uh, primary concerns and we, we fail to seek how we can serve you in your kingdom. Encourage us by the power of your spirit so that we might serve you in word and thought and deed. We Think also of all other believers who worship your, uh, your name this, this Lord's Day in, in the name of our Savior. We think particularly of those who are persecuted. We thank you that the kingdom is, is huge and that it stretches back to antiquity and, and farther into the future than we could possibly imagine. We thank you that your kingdom is growing and, and that it is increasing in many parts of the world. And we acknowledge that in many of these areas where it has been growing in recent years, it is suffering uh, persecution in Africa and in Asia. We pray that you would uh, be with the Christians in these areas, be with those who give them aid, strengthen them. We thank you for the strength that they have shown and that the church continues to show in, in these uh, uh, times of persecution. And we acknowledge that we have never faced this kind of persecution and uh, we pray that you would give us a faith that could stand firm in such uh, a circumstance. Encourage us in, in your service, we pray, and we pray that you would uh, bless us in this time that we have together. We ask that you would accept our words of praise, and may the words that are spoken uh, this morning be faithful to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Our opening hymn is hymn number 287, hymn 287. 297, yes. all hail the power of Jesus' name, 297. <laughs>
Of reading is Psalter selection number eight, Psalm 20, 23, and 24, on page 612. Psalter selection number eight. The Lord hear thee in the day of trouble. The name of the God of Jacob set thee up on high. Send thee help from the sanctuary and strengthen thee out of the fire. Remember all thy offerings and accept thy burnt sacrifice. We will rejoice in thy salvation, and in the name of our God will we set up our banners. The Lord fulfill all thy petitions. Now know I am that the Lord David is anointed. He will hear him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. They are brought down and fallen, but we are risen and stand upright. Save, Lord, let the king hear us when we call. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell 
without their end. For he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessings of the Lord, and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Let's now turn to the Ten Commandments and we'll recite the, the Ten Commandments in unison at the beginning of our Psalter booklets, the second page. God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Hear also the words of our Lord Jesus, how he said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Our scripture this morning is from Ezra chapter 4. We're going to begin at verse 4, continue to the end of Ezra 4. Ezra 4, beginning at verse 4. And our subject is the stop work injunction. The stop work injunction. Ezra 4, beginning at verse 4. Then the people of the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah and troubled them in building, and hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. And in the reign of Hasuerus, in the beginning of his reign, wrote they unto him, an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. And in the days of Artaxerxes wrote Bishlam, Mithridath, and Tabiel, the rest of their companions, unto Artaxerxes, king of Persia, 
and the writing of the letter was written in the Syrian tongue and interpreted in the Syrian tongue. Rehum the Chancellor and Shimei the scribe wrote a letter against Jerusalem to Artaxerxes the king in this sort. Then wrote Rehum the Chancellor and Shimei the scribe and the rest of their companions, the Dinaites and the Aparsathites and the Tarphalites and the Apharsites and the Acharphites and the Babylonians and the Shushanites and the Dehavites and the Elamites and the rest of the nations whom the great and noble Ashurpaner brought over and set in the cities of Samaria and the rest that are on this side of the river and at such a time. And this is the copy of the letter that they sent unto him, even unto Artaxerxes the king. Thy servants, the men on this side of the river, and at such a time, be it known unto the king that the Jews which came up from thee to us are come unto Jerusalem, building the rebellious and the bad city, and have set up the walls thereof, and have rejoined the foundations. Be it known now unto the king that if this city be builded and the walls set up again, then they will not pay toll, cut tribute, and custom, and so thou shalt endamage the revenue of the kings. Now, because we have main, maintenance from the king's palace, and it was not meet for us to see the king's dishonor, therefore we have sent and certified the king, that search may be made in the book of the records of thy fathers, so shalt thou find in the book of the records, and know that this city is a rebellious city, and hurtful unto kings and provinces, and that they have moved sedition within the same of old time, for which cause was this city destroyed. We certify the king that if this city be built again, and the walls thereof set up, by this means thou shalt have no portion on this side the river. <clears throat> then sent the king an answer unto Rehum the chancellor, and to Shimei the scribe, and to the rest of their companions that dwelt in Samaria, and unto the rest beyond the river, peace and at such a time. The letter which ye sent unto us hath been plainly read before me, and I commanded, and search hath been made, and it is found that this city of old time hath made insurrection against the kings, and that rebellion and sedition have been made therein. There have been mighty kings also over Jerusalem, which have ruled over all countries beyond the river, and toll, custom, tribute, and custom was paid unto them. Give ye now commandments to cause these men to cease, and that this city be not builded until other commandment be given from me. Take heed now that ye fail not to do this. Why should damage grow to the hurt of the kings? Now, when the copy of King Artaxerxes' letter was read before Rehum and Shimei the scribe and their companions, they went up to, in haste to Jerusalem unto the Jews and made them to cease by force and power. Then ceased the work of the house of God which is at Jerusalem. So it ceased unto the second year of the reign of Darius king of Persia. <clears throat> In our last lesson, we saw the non-Jewish inhabitant, inhabitants of Judea had approached Zerubbabel with a request that was really likely a demand because of their reaction when they were refused. Their demand was that they should be part of the temple building process. What they were in effect asking was, consider us members of the covenant. Consider us as Jehovah worshipers just like you. We have one purpose. It was really an ecumenical move. However, as we know from 2 Kings, in reality these people were polytheists. And they only started worshiping Jehovah because they were superstitious that they were having problems after they had been brought into the land, and so they asked the king for some guidance about the gods of the land, and he sent them a priest, and that priest told them about the calf worship that they had long practiced in the land. So that was their understanding of Jehovah worship. It was a false worship. It was the calf worship, which was, remember, the worship of the calf in Bethel and Dan rather than going to the temple in Jerusalem. 
In addition, they were worshipping their other gods, as 2 Kings makes clear. Well, Zerubbabel had refused them. He understood enough about their religion to know that they were not covenant members with the Jews, and therefore they were excluded. Now, a number of years has gone by, probably 14 or 15 years have gone by since the Jews had first arrived. The work on the temple had been progressing. We're not told exactly to what extent it had progressed, but it was, it would have been progressing. We're told that they worked against them for some time in just trying to put roadblocks in their way. Now we have another tactic being used to frustrate their efforts in any way possible. And this effort lasted, we're told, until the reign of Darius. They actually put legal impediments in their way. And that was by the form of an injunction from the Persian court. An injunction is a, 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 a government command or a court order to do something or not to do something. In this case, it was to not do something. The work on the temple had to stop. Now, there we should review a little bit about the kings, even though, you know, you when you start trying to figure out who was king when, it gets a little confusing. And we have problems in the Bible because the Bible gives one name, but we have multiple names for many of these kings, and it's sometimes hard to identify what king is being referred to because they have so many names. We'll be talking about that. As you recall, Cyrus was the first Persian king. There was a king briefly before him who was a uh, part of the Medes and other people. The Persians quickly gained dominance over the Medes and Cyrus was the first Persian who was on the throne. He gave the order that they could rebuild the temple. He was king for nine years. He was followed by another very capable emperor, Cambyses II. He was king for eight years. Cambyses actually conquered Egypt during his eight years. And he was in Egypt. He actually went into Ethiopia. He wasn't quite able to conquer Ethiopia, but he made some real gains there, and they paid him some tribute. So he was a very accomplished conqueror. Problem was, he was gone so long, there was a rebellion against him, and his throne was usurped back in Persia. So he had to hurry back to reclaim his throne. The throne was taken over by a group of priests who are known to us as the Magans. Some people believe that this is where the term Magi came from in the Nativity story. At any rate, this priestly class took over and they set someone up on the throne, ostensibly the brother of Cambyses, who died at some point before he got back to Persia. Well, the, the Cambyses' brother was named Smyrtus. And it's believed that he was really not even the true brother of Cambyses, that he was in, uh, posing as the brother of the emperor, now dead, in order to gain himself some legitimacy. So he is called pseudo Smyrtus. <laughs> but he was a, a usurper. Well, they only reigned for seven months, but they're important to this story. The next king was Darius. He reigned for 36 years, established some stability. He was followed by Xerxes and then Artaxerxes. These names become important because we see these names recurring in the Bible, and we have to try to identify the names in the Bible with these people, and they're not always the same, and we're going to talk about why that is. In verses 6 and 7, we have two names. They're both obviously rulers of Persia, but their identity is kind of confusing, and it's been the subject of much debate. And it has to do with when this even takes place. Some people believe this is way later during the rebuilding of the wall, because the building of the wall is mentioned here. I think this probably takes place much earlier when the temple was still under construction under Ezra and Zerubbabel. Okay, the two names are Ahasuerus and Artaxerxes. Well, the name Ahasuerus comes up again in the story of Esther. And 
that's also a major debate among scholars. Who was the Ahasuerus of Esther? Then there's the name Artaxerxes. Well, there is an emperor who's in the list. Of, if you look up the kings of Persia, you'll see the name Artaxerxes. Uh, maybe more than one, but the, the first one we know is Artaxerxes Longamus. Is this referring to him? Now, Cyrus, who gave the order for the first Jews to return, began reigning in 536 B.C. Artaxerxes Longamus began a long co-regency in 473. That's 63 years later. And it was another 20 years before he was the sole regent. He had a very long co-regency with his predecessor. The problem is that kings and emperors often had multiple names and multiple titles. And what we're seeing here are actually titles of kings. To give a modern um, counterpart, the dictator of North Korea, Kim Jong-il, if you look up uh, titles of Kim Jong-il, there's over 50 of them. Great leader, supreme leader, just every good adjective they could they can put in front of his name to, to it's, it's so much, you know, um, fluff, but he has all these official titles. Well, imagine a couple thousand years from now, people are reading all these references to the great leader. Well, which great leader is it? Is it Kim Jong-il? Is it his father or his grandfather? How do we know? It's a title. It's not a name. And we have a lot of these names of the Persian emperors, and sometimes we know them by their title, but that wasn't really their name. They took the title when they became king, and they may have had multiple names and multiple titles. For instance, the word Xerxes. We know, we've heard of Xerxes, he's a famous Persian emperor. Well, the word Xerxes really probably means Shah or king. Until the 70s, there was still a Shah, king of uh, Iran, on the throne. He was deposed in the 70s. The name Ahasuerus that is seen here and in Esther is the words Aha and Suerus. Aha is, probably means the mighty, and Suerus means a king. So it means the mighty king or it, some people think it might mean high father, but it's a title. It could be applied to any emperor on the throne. The word Darius, who's a later emperor than our story, means restrainer. The word Artaxerxes, which also reoccurs it's in, in this chapter, means the great king or perhaps the king of kings. So these are titles which could be applied to one or more kings. So when we, as moderns, create a list of the kings of Persia, it's easy for us to say, well, here's a guy named Artaxerxes. That must be the Artaxerxes of the Bible. That's not always the case. Well, between the reigns of uh, Cambyses II and Darius I was a rebellion against the absent Cambyses while he was in Egypt. And that was by a group, as we've said, called the Magans. And this was a religious group of priests. Now, several people assumed power in this, some sort of a, a conspiracy, and they, they put forward this man who's known to us as the supposed brother of Cambyses on the throne, and that was pseudo Smyrtus. But it was obviously a kind of a shared power sort of thing. It was sort of a group that took power. This is interesting because in this chapter, in verses 13 and 22, the word kings, plural, is used to the Persian court. Now, we could say, well, that applies to the present king and future kings. But, in fact, only during this period when the throne was usurped by this group, were there multiple people claiming power in Persia? Well, because 
Cambyses had conquered Egypt and partially subdued Ethiopia, and then in his absence, the throne was taken by this group who put forward this pseudo-king, pseudo Smyrtus, as the brother of the absent and then mysteriously dead Cambyses. So the Artaxerxes, the great king, of verse 7, may address this pseudo Smyrtus, and it's, it's very likely. Now, what's the significance of, of uh, all, all these names and dead kings? The events are taking place apparently in a very uh, um, short span of time, a relatively narrow span of time. Ezra and Nehemiah were regarded in the Hebrew Bible as one writing. And Esther likely occurs about the same time, just a short distance you know, in the future from where we are right now while these other things were going on. So, in fact, we're specifically, you know, told that it took place in the reign of, uh, apparently it took place in the reign of Darius I in his third year. So that's only like a, um, a few years, about four years future to this. Ow. Now, the stop work injunction, then, therefore, was apparently issued during the reign of the usurper king or king. And they were only in power for a short time, but they were willing to buck the tradition that you don't cross an order of a Persian emperor because they were usurpers. They were willing to do things differently. A usurper would be very sensitive to a letter from a large, representing a large number of the settlers in a province saying, we think you should take this action. Stop work on a building, that's, who cares about this building? It wasn't any skin off their bones. And he says, if we can um, be recognized by this group of people by doing them a favor that doesn't hurt us in the least, and they're saying all the right words, that they're concerned about the, the stability of the empire, they're concerned about the revenue flow coming to, to uh, the, the crown, it says, we'll go ahead and give the stop work order. So that would have been very likely for something a usurper was anxious to jump on this, this group of people who were, were appealing to them as the rightful emperors. It was a law and order appeal to the emperor. The next emperor, who was Darius I, actually killed the usurpers. And he's named by name here. And he reinstated the decree of Cyrus. You see what he was, Darius would do when he reinstated the decree to go ahead and build? He's saying, wait a minute, these were usurpers. A legitimate emperor gave them permission. I'm going to let them go ahead and build. You see? So it all fits in this way. There aren't a lot of timestamps in here, so you have to sometimes study the kings and try to figure out who was king to, order, to, to see what makes sense. Because if you put this at a future period, then you have Ezra and Nehemiah both doing some really weird things about imposing a story from much later early on, and the, the time sequence becomes confusing. And Ezra and Nehemiah commentaries are filled with, you know, we don't know why they brought this in at this point. I see. So it, it does get confusing, and it's not an easy matter to try to reconcile the, the time things on here. But that's one reason the, the, the Newton chronology that we've been using makes a tremendous amount of sense. Well, so at any rate, there's a age, um, there's a jump, a, a span of time that exists between the laying of the foundation of the temple in Ezra 3 and the restraining, uh, the restarting of the temple in chapter 5. And that's really being explained here in chapter 4. The, from the start of the temple until the, it resumed was about 17 years, and the stop work order was in effect for a couple of years. So they had, made, had time to get some progress made on the temple, enough progress to anger their enemies who didn't want to see them succeed, 
and they stopped work during this brief opportunity when the usurpers were in power. So there would have been a serious amount, in that amount of time, there would have been a serious amount of progress made on the temples. That why, is why it would have been very discouraging for the Jews, after that many years of labor on the temple, to see a complete, a complete stop work order. So, the enemies of the Jews, in short, used political events and political power against Zerubbabel and Ezra. What we have here is essentially an injunction against any further progress being made on the temple. The enemies of the Jews had used the power of the state to stop work by claiming treasonous intent and activity on the part of the Jews. They ingratiated themselves to the usurping rulers by feigning a patriotic loyalty and concern for the good of the empire. They appear to have a complete victory until God undid all their gains. And it's amazing how, how this total victory on the crown itself saying, stop work, the order of Cyrus is hereby revoked, and you must stop work on the temple. And they appeared to have a complete victory at that point. So the letter written to Artaxerxes <clears throat> is written to those who usurp the throne from Cambyses. Remember, Artaxerxes is a title, not a name. As we said, Cambyses died mysteriously. It's not known how, as he was resuming to attempt to regain control from the usurpers. A distant relative of his, who we know to history as Darius I, took the throne and killed the usurper king, Pseudosmyrtus. But during that seven-month period of usurpation, the, those rule, usurping rulers were likely very eager to receive pledges of loyalty to themselves. Now, going back to the, the letter written, to them. It's interesting to note the contrast between those non-Jews in Palestine, uh, between what they said to Zerubbabel when they wanted to join the effort and then what they said to the king. When they wanted to join the Jews as members of the covenant, they emphasized their oneness and their similarities. When Zerubbabel declined because he knew they were pagan to the core, they were ready to denounce the Jews as a horrible people to denounce their loyalty and their project. They had been saying, we want to join you in the building. Now they're telling the king, you can't let them finish this project. Verse 7 indicates there was, by the way, more than one letter, but this one was decisive in getting the decision of the crown against them. That one letter is quoted in verses 9 through 16. The primary author is Rehum. And he describes the province as being fiercely loyal, with the exception of one bad element, and that is the Jews. So it's a, it's a very, you know, if, if someone said this, this is a bad element that you've allowed back, that has been allowed back in the land, and you've got to stop them and all things, it's basically a very racist um, proposition that they're giving the king. What he does is he rehearses old history. The old history was the Jews rebelled before more than once. Look it up in the history books. They're just like their ancestors. They've always been a troublesome people. Hezekiah had been paying tribute to the Assyrian Empire. He refused. That got him into trouble. Then Zedekiah also tried the same thing. He rebelled in the days of Jeremiah, and that ended up really ultimately with the destruction of the uh, people. And that destruction was seven decades prior. So they're going back to the history books to convince the king that these Jews are a problem people. Rehum is basically saying, those Jews are at it again. You've got to stop them. 
or history will repeat itself. He doesn't just suggest their motive. He says, stop them now or you will lose Judea. I mean, it's, it's very strongly worded. Now, the letter mentions the wall of Jerusalem. This is why some people believe this was written much later. This was actually about an incident that occurred much later and doesn't even belong here, and that it's really out of historical sequence. They're saying this is back in the days when Nehemiah was building the wall because they accused the Jews of building the wall of Jerusalem. At this point, probably they were only building the temple because then we find out they finished the temple. And we know those were separated by many years. The accusation that they were rebuilding the wall was probably uh, meant to sound threatening. They're doing something that is unauthorized by their decree. They don't, aren't even, they're, they're, they are exceeding their authority in repairing the wall. Now, they may have been clearing rubble away. They may have even been taking stones that were from the wall or could be used in a future construction of the wall and saying, we're going to stack those here, we're going to put them here. They may have made some provision for the building of the wall, as you naturally would have, as you had to clear rubble as necessary. Now, and as we noted, verses 13 and 22, the, there's a plural reference to kings here, which likely means this time when these usurpers were on the throne and their, the face of the uh, conspiracy was this pseudo smirtus Now, the response to the letter came from the Persian court. Now, you have to remember that this came after a period of time and that there were probably people in Judea as well as in Persian who maybe weren't, were concerned about the, author, given the, the authority given to the Jews to rebuild. It would only, they probably thought this was only going to cause trouble. And so they were probably playing to the fears of some that were back in, in the capital of Persia. Well now, a Cambyses had died and a usurper was now on the throne. Different element altogether now controls Persia. And it may be that the truth was known, but all this was a hypocritical show trying to push the buttons of the emperor. And so the, the accusation that they were building the wall may have been intentionally false. And it's possible even that the emperor knew that there was nothing going on that was amiss. It may be that this was just done by bribery, which was very common in the ancient world. Now, and when you phrase it this way, that sedition is going on, you're going to lose the province if you don't stop this. It was framed in language that it was hard to reject. It would have been very easy for any government to read this letter about sedition and saying, well, we're gonna just stop things here. This sounds very dangerous. In any case, it was a power ploy by these uh, non-Jewish elements in Palestine, who were in the majority by far, and really ran things. And so this was an attempt basically to stop the Jews. And it appeared to be completely um, successful. Now. The emperor, the, the crown, the court, Persian court says, we searched the record. And they say some things like how powerful Israel was at one time, maybe briefly under Solomon, but it's a little bit exaggerated. Uh, they, and we're not sure whether they were lying about what they found or where they got this historical information because they were really exaggerating how powerful uh, a, Judah or Israel or both of them combined had ever been with perhaps the exception of Solomon. Um, but the histories actually may have exaggerated it. So maybe they were getting their history from the Assyrians and the Babylonians. What usually happened in the ancient world was if you conquered somebody, you exaggerated how powerful they were and how dangerous they were. Just like 
I used to follow um, boxing, and they bad boxers before the how would would badmouth how how bad this the boxer was, and as soon as they won the fight, they compliment the fighter on what a tough opponent he really was. You see, because that makes them look better if they fought a, a tough guy, um, and they they won a hard fight. So after it's over and they won. They, they want to build up the abilities of that other boxer. And the Assyrian and Babylonian records probably did that. But, so after claiming to have verified this bad history of the Jews, an injunction was given, authorizing Rehum to stop all rebuilding efforts. Rehum immediately, after reading the letter, took a force, went to Jerusalem, and forced the Jews to stop. It doesn't say he read the order. It says he forced them by force and power to stop them. He broke things up. And this is how things stood until, we're told, the second year of Darius, which is only a couple of years away because these usurpers only reigned uh, for about seven months. So the second year of Darius was just a couple of years later. So if we've correctly identified this Ahasuerus, this great king, as these imposters and the usurper Pseudosmyrtus, the injunction was in effect about two years. So, but during that two years, and certainly at the time of the order was given, if you had been an observer at the time, if you had been with the Jews, it would appear that the ungodly had won a total victory. The crown just doesn't issue orders and then reverse them easily. This was how it was going to be. Forget the building of the temple. It's not going to happen. The Jews now were back in the land. They were a minority, but they were now more vulnerable than ever because their enemies had gained a complete victory over them. They were a hated minority now because they had stood firm and they said we're not going to assimilate with the people of the land we're going to maintain our identity but particularly when it comes to the temple and the covenant the state had given them permission to rebuild not just the temple but their covenant relationship with God but that government had now revoked it they were basically in a very ambiguous place right now they were in a worse place now in Judea than they had been in Babylon. Cyrus, who gave the order to rebuild the temple, had been dead for eight years. They had already, once they were in the land, covenanted to serve God and not assimilate with the people. When they refused to assimilate with the people, did God bless them immediately? No. He gave them a reverse. The people turned against them and appeared to win a complete victory. So much for pledging your loyalty to your God. Look where it got you. See? Their whole mission in coming back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple appeared to be a complete failure. It's interesting that God let their enemies believe that they had completely succeeded in stopping these Jews. If you go back to Ezra, the first verse of the first chapter of Ezra, it talks, of, when it introduces Cyrus issuing the order to rebuild the temple, what was going on, Ezra 1.1 1, 1 says that the word of the Lord, it might be, you know, made known. Let me look at that, read it exactly. Ezra 1.1. 1, 1. Uh, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia. See, God was working through Cyrus. This wasn't a political decision by Cyrus. It was God's decision, and God was just working through Cyrus. And if you stand firm on that, things are going to happen, even when you have apparent setbacks. And this was a major setback. Well, within two years, the work on the temple had actually resumed. That's because the usurpers were ununsurped. Darius, a distant relative of the dead Cambyses, assumed control and actually killed Pseudosmyrtus. 
In fact, Pseudo-Smyrtus is no longer considered a real emperor, and he goes by the title in history as Pseudo-Smyrtus. He goes by the title of a usurper. He certainly not, doesn't go by the name Artaxerxes, a great king. J.G. McConville wrote a small book on Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther in which he made an important point. He said the issue was causation. Causation is the relationship between cause and effect. What ultimately causes or determines what happens. There is a scientific causation that we study in biology and, and chemistry but there's also, it's also a philosophical term. And the word, instead of ca uh, ca causation, the word determines is a more theological term by which we understand God determines things because he decrees them. God is the ultimate cause of what happens. That's certainly what Ezra said in the first verse of the first chapter. See, in the modern world, causation usually follows Darwin in some way. Darwin saw everything that was physical as caused by the properties inherent in matter. So causation was chemical, it was then biological, and in the social world it was environmental. It's your environment. It's what's around you is acting on you and that determines things. Men who prioritize externals, however, ignore the moral and ethical causes, and they always ignore the fact that God is the great determiner. They believe man can control things by dictating the environment, even by force. And Rehum was eager to impose this order by force. Statism is men using the power of the state to control the future, to cause the future by decree. And sometimes they have very fearful power and they seem to be unstoppable. But dozens of, of tyrannies have risen up over the years and exerted extreme control. The problem is when men try to play God in that way, ultimately they are self-defeating and self-destructive. Rehum thought that, his, that he could control the future and that he had won a great victory and he had determined the future. So as soon as he read the letter, he hurried to Jerusalem to force change by the power of the state. The words here in our chapter are by force and power. He didn't proclaim it. He didn't read it to the Jews and tell them you have to stop work. He used force on the Jews. It was a show of power show of force. The will and actions of the king were seen as causative. Verse 22 makes this clear. He says, you, the king, king, you must act or this is going to be the result. It's all up to you. And then verse 21, the king said, I have acted and nothing can be done to change this unless I decree it. It's all about me. It's all about the crown. I will determine the future of the Jews. The injunction to stop work ended up facilitating the work, as we'll see more in another lesson. See, the usurpers had reversed Cyrus's order. Okay? When Darius killed the usurper and claimed the throne, he was ready to restore the order of a legitimate emperor. See, and he undid the work of the usurper. Politically, things have not looked particularly good for the people of God in recent years. And it's easy to see how could they ever think, how could they ever change? And yet, what we're told in Scripture is that the of the increase of his government, there will be no end. Yeah. Proverbs 16, 9 says, A man... A man's heart deviseth his way, but the Lord directeth his steps. This is true of the ungodly as well as the godly. God has used men like 
Darius. He's used men like uh, um, Nebuchadnezzar. He's used evil men throughout history to do his will. Ultimate causation is by God. Now, we're no more than secondary causes. This is also true of the will of men in salvation. God's will governs us and all things. We do have a will. My objection is to the term man's free will. Man has a will, but ultimately God controls the will of man. And when the Holy Spirit draws a man, he does will to be saved. But it's ultimately the will of God that controls the will of man. Ultimate causation is by God. And the will of the Persian emperor to destroy the work that God had ordered was frustrated. So, and it's because we believe that ultimate causation, ultimate determination is by God that we can believe all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. This was true in Ezra and Zerubbabel's day and it's still true in ours. Amen. So we have faith that the attempts of the evil men to frustrate the work of God and the advance of his kingdom are going to fail, and they're going to fail miserably. Amen. Let's pray. Amen. Our most good and gracious God and Heavenly Father, we pray that you give us a, a, a big picture understanding of how you work in history. We acknowledge that we're sometimes very frustrated by evil, we're frustrated when evil men seem to have ascendancy and power. We're frustrated when they, they seem to interfere with uh, how we would like to see your kingdom advance. We, we cry with the martyrs in heaven, how long, O Lord? We want to see your kingdom advance. We want to see your name vindicated sooner, not later. We pray that you would Give us a, a patient view of our responsibility and, and help us to, to seek to serve your kingdom in the areas where we do have power, we do have influence, we do have control, even though if they're on the individual or the social level. Help us not to be discouraged what we see around us, but help us always to see the world around us in, in the light of your word and help us to remember you are the ultimate determiner, you are the ultimate cause of all things and that your will will prevail. In, in our day as it did in Ezra's day. We ask this in Christ our Savior's name. Amen. Our closing hymn is 100. 100, 100. Number 100. Holy, holy, holy. Let us stand and sing holy, holy, holy. <laughs>
offer the benediction. And now go in peace. May God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit bless you and keep you, guide and protect you this day and always. Amen. <laughs>